Um, so new business involves oh, new business involves that's period five. Oh no, did I forget to I forgot to um, create an assignment. And this will be due Thursday. at class time. So there is uh, there's this uh, it's a review. It's gonna strongly resemble the test. Um, oh I thought I thought I hit admit. It's going to strongly resemble the test. Not perfectly, but strongly. Um, None of it should be a surprise. This should all be pretty familiar. Calculating pH from mass or volume. So we have a volume of a mass. We should be able to know calc like concentration. Um, these are so. Um, Chat. What? I forgot to open my chat window. Chat says, oh, I forgot it was Friday. It is Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. We get a short weekend, this, or a normal weekend, not a short weekend. Um, so there, there's this um, approximate pH, stuff about Bronsted Lowry definition of acids and bases, um, stuff about conjugate acids and base pairs. Um, stuff about the strength of an acid, and um, oh, there's a, a question about a cup of coffee because I saw it and I had to include it. Um, and there's one there's one question about um, like the last thing we did, the partial neutral partial neutralization. Um, but this is yeah. Uh, which is a weak acid, uh, which is a strong electrolyte. POH is this. What's the H uh, concentration of H plus? Anyway, um, we also have another PowerPoint, and it's I stole this PowerPoint. I stole it. I stole it. I'm just gonna say I stole it uh, from the same website that I stole the first PowerPoint from, um, because it's a good good website. And um, uh, there's the, this one is like animated and animations. I don't know if you if you've ever made a PowerPoint before, but animations take so much time to do, like insane amounts of time went into this PowerPoint. And I was just like deleting slides like they didn't matter because we didn't cover them. Um, beautiful slides that somebody spent time working on and, and I just delete them. All right. Um, but this is what we've been talking about is equilibrium and acids and bases. And when we talk about equilibrium, what we're talking about is a reversible reaction that can uh, proceed either from the reactants to the products or be reversed and proceed from the products back to the reactants. Um, and acid dissociation, why this matters is acid dissociation is a reversible reaction. And so, are, so is base dissociation. Um, so it happens like this. So um, it goes back and forth at equilibrium. 
So the acid, H2SO4, dissociates into two H plus and sulfate, SO4 two minus. And if we mix acids and bases, they'll neutralize. Um, but each of these things will dissociate in this kind of reversible reaction. So what is equilibrium anyway? And equilibrium is the, the state at which the forward reaction rate, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. So I know both of these, oops, both of these arrows are pointing in the same direction, but um, the reactant and product have been reversed. So the rate at which product forms from reactant is the same as the rate at which uh, reactant forms back from product. So in our acid dissociation example, um, it, you know, we can kind of see how, so we have product side and we have reactant side and at equilibrium, the rate at which each of these things is happening is balanced and equal. Um, oh, I've missed my chance. I haven't included a Thanos meme. And it looks like nothing is happening, but um, that's not true. It's just that the things are both happening at the same rate, so the one thing balances the other thing. Um, it doesn't mean that we have half of one thing and half of the other thing. It means that both reactions are happening at the same rate, and so the, the product of the one thing, the product of the back reaction, or the, the reactant formation is equal to product formation. Um, so like if we're running on a treadmill, we reach, we want to maintain equilibrium in our body. So uh, a couple things happened. We increase our breathing rate. We increase our heart rate. Uh, we start to sweat as our temperature increases. We want to keep our temperature within a, a certain range. Um, so we do all these things to make, maintain physiological equilibrium. Um, and a, a better example, one that I kind of like more, is suppose you're in a boat. You're in a boat and there's a bucket-sized hole in the boat. And you're trying not to sink and you're bailing with all you got. And, but for every bucket that you throw out of the boat, another bucket full of water enters the boat through the bucket-sized hole. So you're at equilibrium just bailing as fast as you can. Just bail every bucket that gets thrown out, another bucket comes back in. We also talked about this guy, Le Chatelier, and his shining principle of equilibrium, which says that when a system at equilibrium is disturbed, it shifts to a new equilibrium that counteracts the disturbance. And we said this in a slightly different and slightly simpler way. We said that a reaction at equilibrium can be shifted to product formation by adding reactant or taking away product. I'll say that again. A reaction at equilibrium can be shifted toward product formation by either adding reactant so either pushing from the product side or pulling from the reactant side. Sorry, pulling from the product side. All right. So let's look at an example. Uh, here we have the Haber process. We have nitrogen and hydrogen, and we're smashing them together to make ammonia. We can, I, if we add more nitrogen, we can shift the equilibrium toward forming product. If we add more hydrogen, <clears throat> we can also shift the equilibrium toward forming product. Now, if we add more ammonia, because we're forming product, what actually happens is we shift the equilibrium back toward forming reactant. But if we remove ammonia, we can shift that equilibrium toward forming more, more of our product. 
So, um, and we kind of saw this. We, we saw this when we were doing uh, the silver nitrate uh, precipitation experiment, the, the single replacement with a copper wire. We might not have known that we, we saw it, but if we think about it, like at a certain point, like the, the precipitation around, um, around the copper wire kind of slowed down and um, and then, but if you shake the the precipitate off of the copper wire, it like it starts reacting again, kind of fast. Um, so we can remove product and shift the equilibrium back toward more product to form. Um, and if we add a catalyst. That doesn't actually shift the equilibrium at all. There's no shift. All a catalyst will do is make it um, faster or easier to form, form product. So it makes us achieve equilibrium faster. We can increase the pressure of each of these things. And actually what increasing pressure does is it, it has the effect of adding more of our reactants. Because um, with these, we have gases um, and what we're doing, uh, anytime we add more of the reactant, or if we increase the pressure, what we end up doing is increasing the interatomic or intermolecular collisions that um, are what drive the formation of product. So we need these, the N2 and the H2 to like run into each other and interact in order to get product to form. And if we increase the pressure, we kind of squeeze everything closer together and we make it more likely for that to happen. So by increasing pressure, we can increase the uh, shift. We can, we can shift toward product formation. What we're actually dealing with, though, are acids and bases. Um, acids have a pH that's less than 7. Bases have a pH that's greater than 7, um, which means that something that's exactly 7 is neutral. Or, uh, or balanced, it's pH balanced. Um, taste, acids taste sour or um, delicious, as I like to call it. And bases taste, well, they taste bitter or delicious, as I like to call it. Um, acids react uh, with bases and bases react with Anyone else get acids? Bases react with acids. We sure do. Um, acids are proton donors, while bases are proton acceptors. If we recall, this was the Bronsted and Lowry definition of the acid and base, where the acid donates a proton and the base accepts a proton. Acids will turn litmus red. We haven't really talked about that too much. And bases, meanwhile, will turn litmus blue. So litmus is, is uh, something called a pH indicator. Um, and pH indicators, what they'll do is they'll just change color um, according to the concentration of the H+. Acids have lots of H+, or H3O+. I say H+, because it's easier to say than H3O+. There are fewer words. Why use many word when few word do trick? <laughs> um, well, bases have lots of OH minus. Acids will react with metals. Um, and bases don't. Bases don't. You can use bases to clean like fine silverware. Like wood ash is lye. And, yeah. Both of them are electrolytes, um, which will conduct electricity. Um, in solution. Pure water, pure water does not conduct electricity, believe it or not. Um, there's not enough of um, a constant, there's not enough of an ion concentration in pure water to have it be an effective conductor. Um, you need to dissolve some kind of charged particle in the water, some electrolyte, in order for the water to conduct electricity. We have a pH scale, which measures acidity or basicity. In the middle, the neutral pH is 7. 
way over on the left on the acid side are things like your stomach, which has a pH around 1. Um, it, lemons, which have a pH around 2. Um, onward and upward, I think those are grapes. They look like grapes. Um, at around 3. Then we'll waddle away, waddle, waddle. Um, to tomatoes, which have a pH around 4, and uh, bananas around 5, milk around 6, and egg at 8 over on the basic side. Um, and then baking soda um, at 9, sodium bicarbonate. Um, interesting thing about baking soda, baking soda can act as an acid or a base depending on the concentration of H+. So baking soda in labs, uh, a lot of labs that deal a lot with acids and bases, like the general chemistry lab at, uh, uh, like a university general chemistry lab, they, they have like kind of jars of baking soda just like in every fume hood in case somebody spills an acid or a base. You can throw baking soda on it and it will neutralize it um, and let you clean it up. Um, soap, soap is basic, that's a bar of soap. Um, over at around 12, we have, I think that's bleach, and then clear over at 14, we have oven cleaner, which is basically, uh, it's, I, I think it's mostly sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide with, in some cases, an ionic surfactant to make it kind of, like, sudsy. Um, and you can spray that on cooked on grease in the oven and it, the, the, the strong bases will go ahead and attack all the oils that are caked onto the oven, turn them into water-soluble saponified oils. Just like the reaction we just did with the soap. With the soap. Ah uh, yes, office reference, of course, um, yes, I do my best. Um, each step on the pH scale, ooh, here's a question. Each step on the pH scale represents a factor of what? A factor of what? This is a number, a numerical value, factor of what? I'll give you a hint, it starts with a one and ends with a zero. What is it? I got a 10. I got a 10. Someone said 10. Yes, it is 10. 10, of course, starts with a 1 and ends with a 0. Like, I mean... Okay, um, so pH 5 versus pH 6 would be 10 times more acidic. Um, so more acidic toward the lower end and less acidic toward uh, the higher end. Um, so pH 3 versus pH 5 is how many times different? One hundred? One hundred! Yes. And finally, uh, I don't know if that gets cut off in my video or not. Let me see. Oh, it does. Oh, it does. Let me turn off studio mode and I can maybe... pH 8 versus pH 13. There we go. Okay. It's going to be a hundred thousand times different. So five orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude between pH 8 and pH 13. And it does that um, because of the negative logarithm. And we'll talk about that again in a moment. Um, but for now, uh, let's talk about some common acids and strong
strong acids. These are things that dissociate 100%. So this is what we mean by the strength of the acid. What we're not talking about so much is how concentrated that acid is. So when we say that an acid is strong, what we mean is it dissociates close to 100%. So at equilibrium, um, and these are things like hydrochloric acid, which is stomach acid. We use it for like pickling or cleaning metals. Um, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, which is the number one chemical produced in the world and is found in car batteries, for instance. Um, there's a shiny car battery. And then nitric acid, which gives us explosives and fertilizers. Um, and uh, where, where are we going? Okay. And we can contrast those with weak acids, which just don't dissociate quite as much. Oh, one more thing. Hydrochloric acid, along with uh, two other of the common halogens. Um, so the four common halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And all of the halogens except for fluorine will form strong acids. So hydrobromic acid and hydroiodic acid are also strong acids. Weak acids will dissociate very little. So instead of being like almost 100% dissociated into H plus and acetate, acetic acid, kind of, you know, the, as the protonated form where the, the H plus is still stuck to the original molecule, this tends to be the dominant form. Now, according to Le Chatelier, since this is in equilibrium, we can push it in one direction or the other by either adding more of the reactant, so we can increase the concentration of H plus by loading up on the concentration of our reactant. We can still get a really low pH with this acid by just having a lot of it. We can also get a lot of, um, we can pull it in the other direction. We can, we can encourage product formation. We can get more of the original reactant to dissociate by either removing H plus or removing uh, the acetate, the counter ion. So we can affect equilibrium by either adding reactant or decreasing or taking away product. Uh, vinegar is made, uh, this acetic acid is vinegar, and uh, we find it also in apples, along with malic acid, um, which we also put on warheads, uh, the candies. Uh, hydrofluoric acid is that one weak acid out of the halogens, and it's a weak acid because the nuclear radius of fluorine is, like, so small that the, the, the proton, the hydrogen uh, nucleus, just kind of sticks to it through inter-nuclear forces. It's, a, it's, like, it's like a gravitational pull. Um, so it, it ends up dissociating way, way, way less than any of the other halogenated acids. Um, and we use hydrofluoric acid to etch glass. And uh, does it, did, it, did anyone else watch Breaking Bad? If you watch Breaking Bad, there's, there's a, another, it's actually a fictional uh, use for um, hydrofluoric acid. It doesn't actually work like that. I'm not gonna spoil the series in case, in case you wanna go and, and catch that one. It is probably a show worth watching, um, although I kind of enjoy Better Call Saul a bit better. Um, it's just, it's less dark. It's still kind of dark, but it's less dark. Um, oh, and as I mentioned in a previous class, hydrofluoric acid will, um, if you get it into your bloodstream, it will make all the, the calcium in your bloodstream precipitate out, and then you end up um, not being able to have a heart beat because your, your heart relies on calcium ions to, to, to beat. Um, and so hydrofluoric acid can stop your heart, uh, put you in cardiac arrest. Um, anyway, it's kind of scary stuff, kind of scary. Um, 
you, you just you have to be careful with it. Anyway, uh, citric acid is uh, in lemons and limes and sour candies and um, uh, and then ascorbic acid is also it's vitamin C and we find that in citrus and also in acerola berries. That's where we get the name ascorbic acid from acerola berry. And then we have lactic acid, which is uh, so CH3, CHOH, COOH. So this is the partially oxidized form of pyruvate. Pyruvate is half of a glucose molecule, and we form lactic acid when we can't replenish ATP by using oxidative phosphorylation. Um, in order uh, in, in our metabolism. So when we have aerobic metabolism, we don't really make so much lactic acid, but when we have anaerobic metabolism, when there's not enough oxygen around, we form lactic acid from the pyruvate in order to keep our muscles working. Um, and then that makes us sore. It's a waste product of muscular exertion um, that happens when, when there's not. Who's cardiac and why did he arrest my dad? I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I, I, I hope that you can move forward and still have positive role models in your life. Carbonic acid is another weak acid. It's what we get when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water and get our delicious fizzy beverages. Um, I'm bonated. I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at my here, whoop, carbonated beverages. Oh, there we are. Hey, that's better. Okay. Um, and um, so that exists in equilibrium with the atmosphere. And if we have a higher concentration of uh, H2CO3 in our beverage than we do a concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, then we'll get bubbles flying out of our solution as the uh, as the as it strives to reach equilibrium. Um, if we pressurize this whole system and like push a bunch of gas into that liquid, then we can carbonate it again. Um, similarly, if we just increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere we can get a higher concentration of H2CO3 or carbonic acid. So if we do that in rainwater, we can end up dissolving limestone. And if we do that over time, we can get cave formation. Um, so this also contributes to the natural acidity of lakes. And if we keep pushing CO2 into the atmosphere, eventually we'll increase the acidity of all of our bodies of water. If we do that for long enough, uh, the ocean will reach a point at which uh, the primary producer of biomass, the plankton, uh, the diatomaceous plankton, which are little tiny, um, tiny, tiny algae, basically, with a, uh, a calcium carbonate skeleton, those things won't be able to produce their calcium carbonate skeletons anymore. And the primary producer of biomass will shift from being a calcium carbonate based form of life to being a silicate based form of life. And I don't know if you've ever tried to eat silica, but it's not very tasty. Um, so basically, if we keep acidifying the oceans, we'll end up completely shifting the basis of food production in the ocean. Um, and that's a big problem. Um, all right, so what makes a strong acid strong is its ability to fall apart. <laughs> it falls apart so completely that uh, we, we, when we draw the equilibrium arrows, we like to make the arrow toward the reactant side, uh, sorry, toward the product side. We make the arrow toward the product side much larger than the arrow toward the reactant side. We also just kind of can like almost forget about the arrow in the backward direction. Uh, so we'll write these either as two arrows of differing length or just a single arrow. And what this means is that, so suppose we have this graphical representation um, where we have the H plus stuck to the NO3 minus, 
And um, for every one of those, we get one of each of the products. So, or for every two of those molecules, we get two of the products. So if we have like a hundred of them, then we'll get a hundred of each of the products. Or if we have a thousand of them in a liter, then we'll have that same concentration of our products. So if we have like this concentration, 0.0058 molar, we'll have that same concentration in our products. So HCl dissociates completely. If we have 4.0 molar HCl, we'll have 4.0 molar H plus and 4.0 molar Cl minus, but we don't really care about that um, because it doesn't really contribute to the pH of the solution. It doesn't contribute to the concentration of H plus. So since there's only one proton in HCl or only one H plus, we call it a monoprotic acid. Sulfuric acid, on the other hand, we get two protons and sulfate. You get two protons. There are two protons or two H plus stuck to that sulfate. It dissociates. We get two protons and the sulfate. So since there are two protons, we call it a diprotic acid. Diprotic. And if we have 2.3 molar sulfuric acid, once that dissociates, we get 4.6 moles per liter, 4.6 moles per liter of H+, but then still only 2.3 moles per liter of SO4-2-. Similarly here with the, you know, something like calcium hydroxide, where we have Ca2+, and 2OH-, when, uh, when we're looking at its effect on acidity, we're only going to be looking at that concentration of OH minus. And since there are two molar equivalents of the OH minus, we'll get twice the effective concentration of that base. All right. So some calculations. Calculations. Um, Recall that the hydronium ion is the species, so when we take that hydrogen ion and we stick it to water, we get the hydronium ion, and OH- is the hydroxide ion. And we have this analogy that I'm not too fond of, but that wasn't the reason I included this slide. This is the reason. For this class in any aqueous solution, our pH plus our pOH is equal to 14. And we haven't talked about this thing, this other thing, but this is saying the same thing as what we say when we say that pH plus pOH equals 14. So these two things are exponents. And adding two exponents is what we do when we multiply two things that have exponents, right? So what we're talking about here are these the exponents that we need in order to get these, these two concentrations. So if we multiply these two things together, we get this opposite of this exponent. Does that make sense? That's all we're saying. All right. This is all the stuff that we've been saying all, all this time. So. The pOH is the opposite power of 10 that we need in order to get this concentration of OH minus, which is the same as saying the concentration of OH minus is 10 to the negative pOH. So pOH is the opposite power of 10 that we need to get OH minus. And the logarithm can be a little bit tricky to get your head around. So let's look at this using, we have a, we have a flow chart here. So this is the simple thing to think about. pH plus pOH equals 14. The sum of those two exponents 
is 14. It's negative 14. I mean, this, because they're negative exponents, but the pH and pOH are the opposite of the power of 10 that we need to get the concentration of each of those ions. So here we have, over on this side, we have concentration of H3O plus or OH or, or H plus, it's H plus. And this is what we're saying. This is all we're saying. The concentration of H plus is equal to 10 to the minus pH power, which is the same as saying, or which is the reciprocal of this thing here. So pH is the opposite power of 10 that we need to get this concentration of H plus. So these are reciprocal functions. Does everyone know what reciprocal functions are? What I'm talking about when I say reciprocal functions. So if I have a function of x, f of x, then 1 over x is the reciprocal of that function, right? So these are like, these are, these are how to solve for the thing on the other side of the equation. You see what I mean? So like the reciprocal, so if we're trying to solve for this variable pH and we have concentration of H3O plus or concentration of H plus, then we use the reciprocal function in order to solve for it. That's it. That's all we're doing. That's what the log is. And it can be useful to kind of familiarize yourself with the pattern that it makes, because it's a pattern. So it's like, um, so if I, I just like start playing around with my calculator and I'm like, all right, I use, so it's the, the negative log of concentration gives me a pH. So if I have a negative, then I get to the log and I'm, I'm going to do like point, I'm going to use simple powers of 10. So like zero point, like, what is that? Eight zeros and a one, and it gives me nine. So the negative log of 10 to the minus nine is nine. Make sense? The negative, the, the negative log, the anti-log, the anti-log, negative log is anti-log, negative log of 10 to the minus 9 is 9. So if we have 10 to the minus 9 moles per liter of H3O plus, we'll have a pH of 9. It's simple, like, basically you can only do logs in your head if it's already a power of 10. If it's already a power of 10. For anything else, use your calculator. Just plug it into the calculator. Just plug it into the calculator. What this also means is that we can solve directly for concentration of H plus from concentration of OH minus. We didn't really talk about this, um, but like if we have the concentration of OH minus and we want to solve for a concentration of, o of H plus, we just divide 10 to the minus 14 by that concentration and then problem solved. We have our concentration of H plus, but that's kind of cumbersome. And it's way easier to just like, if we're trying to solve for pH, because nobody, nobody ever really asks for or cares about pOH unless they're trying to calculate pH. So, uh, so we tend to go this way around this, flowchart a lot more. So suppose we have a pH of 4.87 and we want to know the concentration of H plus. So we're starting in the upper left corner, we're going to the upper right corner, we have to solve for this here, H3O plus. So we're just going to take 10 and raise it to the opposite of our pH power, raise it to the power of the opposite of our pH. So negative 4.87 
10 to the negative 4.87 will give us our concentration of H+. Plus. On the graphing calculator, you got to hit second and then log, and then that gives us 10 to the x power. Hit the negative or the the yeah the negative sign, and then 4.87 equals, and it gives us this concentration, this number 1.35 times 10 to the minus 5. All right. If the concentration of OH minus is this thing, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. Find the pH. All right, so now we're down in this corner here. Now we're down in this corner. We're trying to find this corner. So we can either go this way or we can go this way. So if we go this way, we take 10 to the minus 14 and divide it by this number here, and we'll get this number. And then we still have to take the anti-log of that number to get to this number. So going from here to here, we find that 10 to the minus 14 divided by 5.6 times 10 to the 11 is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, and then we find the pH by taking the negative log of that, and we find that the pH is 3.75. But I kind of think that it's easier to, like we, we're already doing a negative log one way or the other, we're doing a negative log. So, like, if we go this direction, we'll find the POH, that's 10 to the 10, 10 to the 2.5. Then we'll subtract that from 10 from, uh, sorry, we'll subtract that from 14 and find that the, the answer is the same. The answer is the same. And again, that's because for this, we are adding exponents. And for this, we're still adding exponents, still adding exponents. The P refers to a negative power of 10, a negative exponent. So like we multiply this by a negative, by negative one to find that actual exponent. Anyway, find the pH of 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4 nitric acid solution. We're going to assume that it dissociates completely. Our, our H plus is what affects the pH. The nitrate we don't really care about. We have concentration of H plus. We're starting up over here. We're going over here. So we're just going to take the negative log of that. Simple 3.24. Okay, how about this one? We have 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5 molar barium hydroxide. Our first step, again, is writing our dissociation expression so that we know our ratio of reactants and products. 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5 we're going to have that same concentration of barium ions, but we'll have twice that concentration of hydroxide ions. The hydroxide is what affects the pH. The barium is just kind of there. We're starting way down here, and we want to find the pH. The easiest way to do that is by finding the pOH and then subtracting that value from 14. So we'll take the negative log of our concentration of OH minus to find our POH, and then we'll subtract that from 14. Find the concentration of an, a sulfuric acid solution. Okay, now we have a pH, and we want to know the concentration of our sulfuric acid. What concentration, how many moles per liter sulfuric acid do we have with this pH? So we've set up our dissociation expression. We have a pH. We're going over to the H3O plus, or the concentration of H3O plus. We're going to leave some space because what we're actually looking for isn't the concentration of H3O plus, but it's the concentration of 
sulfuric acid. So concentration of H plus is 10 to the minus pH. So we're going to raise 10 to the negative pH power. That gives us a concentration of H plus, which is 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4 molar, molar or moles per liter. We'll put that up there. But we have two moles of hydrogen ion for every mole of sulfuric acid. So we have to convert that. We don't care about sulfate. No one cares about sulfate. It's OK, sulfate. We still care. It's OK. So we want to know what concentration that is. So we have to divide our concentration by the however much acidity it contributes, right? So we have to convert back. And we've done that. We've spent a lot of time doing that in notes. So we have a sulfuric acid solution that's 0 0.21 millimolar, but it's sulfuric acid, so it's still dangerous, I guess. Not very concentrated, though. All right. Um, and we're going to find the, hang on, I'm going to, how much time do we have? How much time do we have? Can somebody, can somebody time check how much time? Are, are we out at 1240? All right, we're going to find the solution, sorry, find the pH of a solution where we have 3.65, we have three minutes left, thank you. pH of a solution with 3.65 grams of hydrochloric acid in 2.00 cubic decimeters of solution. Does anyone know what volume, how many liters is in a cubic decimeter? How many, how many liters is in a cubic decimeter? So a cubic decimeter is a cube that's 10 centimeters on each side. So it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So there are a thousand cubic centimeters in a cubic decimeter. Does anyone have, do you have does anyone know what, how many liters a cubic centimeter is? Cubic centimeter. So a cubic centimeter is one milliliter. So there are a thousand cubic centimeters in a cubic decimeter, which means a cubic decimeter is equal to one liter. So here we have 2.00 liters of solution. I don't know why they, they're just trying to confuse people. Remind, not confuse, remind everyone of the interconvertibility of the metric system. Great, here we are. Um, so we have hydrochloric acid. We wanna find the concentration of hydrochloric acid in order to find the pH. So we want to know how many moles are in a liter. We know we have 3.65 grams. We know the molar mass of hydrochloric acid. And we know that we have 2.0 liters, 2.00 liters. So when we crunch all our numbers, we get that our concentration of hydrochloric acid is 0.05 moles per liter, which means we have 0.05 moles of H plus. We refer back to our flow chart. We have a concentration of H plus. We need to take the opposite logarithm, the negative logarithm of that concentration in order to find our pH. When we do that, we see that our pH is 1.3. All right. We are out of time. I did want to talk about acid dissociation constants. It's products over reactants. That's all. That's all the time we have for today. Um, for strong acids, the dissociation constant is big because we have almost no of the protonated form. We have almost no, none of the reactant. It completely dissociates. We get lots of these, lots of the product, very small denominator, 
very large numerator equals big dissociation constant. We're going to assume that it's 100%. Assume that it's 100%. For weak acids, it predominates in the other direction. This is small. Now, as I've mentioned, we can push these in one direction or, or the other by adding more of this, we can get more of this protonated form. By adding more of this, we can get more H plus and more of this. Or by, if we remove the acetate, we can get more H plus to fall off of the original. Um, but this all happens in this ratio. It will maintain this ratio even though the amounts may differ. So we might have a different concentration, but this ratio of product to reactant will remain constant. That's why it's called a constant. And they're different for each compound. They're different for each compound. And for weak acids, the dissociation constant is very small, which means that it favors the reactant side rather than the product side. That's all, that's all. The weaker the acid, the smaller the Ka, the stronger the acid, the larger. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing and stop my recording. Thank you for your time. It's the weekend. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you.